Cornelius and a member of a, a newly formed group, Friends of Historic Brunswick, and also in conjunction with and working with the Brunswick Heritage Museum, Mr. James Castle. And we are working to preserve a, a lot of the uh, B&O Railroad history that, that we've um, uh, not lost, but we've let fade a little bit in Brunswick, Maryland. And we're, we'll be uh, working on several projects with the caboose. The caboose we're, we're working from today is a, it's a B&O Railroad I-5 caboose. The caboose number is C-1926. The caboose itself was built in 19, uh, 1925 time frame, built at Mount Clare Shops near Baltimore, Maryland. And we'd like to run you through some of the process of what went on, the daily job of the conductor and the brakeman uh, as, as they crewed up this caboose for a trip either westbound to Cumberland, Maryland on the Cumberland Division or could have been eastbound to Baltimore, Maryland on, on the Baltimore Division. along with me here for a little bit, bear with me, and uh, we'll try and give you a tour of Caboose 1926, and we'd like to bring out the Caboose, irregardless of where it operated, it was a multi-use, multi-use vehicle, and uh, it, it served many purposes, but one thing, we had a lot of storage area, and the crew itself, the crew which conductor and your brake, we had a two-man crew on the, on the rear of the train. The, carried a lot, a lot of safety type equipment. Fusees, these are all for signaling type devices. You, you have to imagine now there's no direct voice communications between the rear of the train and the engine. The only way to talk is either through whistle, uh, the, the uh, caboose whistle on the, uh, the, uh, the engine, or through hand signals using flags, lights, lanterns, Fusees, which was a very hot fire, it was a stick, and uh, that, that would be ignited and uh, burns very, very hot, could be seen for long distances, and they could use that for signaling. All of this stuff needed room to carry, and of course they had a, a, not just one of these, they had a supply of, of the fusees, they also had uh, the, their the lanterns and stuff that they carried with them. Also, very important to be used to stop a train would be the, the, a torpedo, which was in it. That was uh, like probably when it went off, it was louder than any firecracker that we used. All of this was stored on the side, these, these compartments, and you also had tools that actually make for making uh, emergency repairs and so forth. But all of that would be stored under what is actually a bunk. Uh, talked about is multi-use. Went on board the caboose at moving and it was used as an office space. The conductor himself was, he was in charge of the train. He was the one that had all the way bills consisting of, of each car that they were pulling and delivering. Also stated the shipper, the weight of the contents which was very important to the crew and also the destination, what company the, uh, the uh, supplies were going to. And all of this the conductor was in charge of. The brakeman was there, the brakeman did a lot um, uh, to assist the conductor. This on the road, if, if they were out for extended period of times, say in, in a work train type environment where they were actually out working, this could also be used as a sleeper. And we, we have the mats, how comfortable it would be, but, uh, but yeah, it was also a sleeper when they were out for extended periods of time and for rest areas. It also served as an office space. Forward, there was a, uh, in, well, in the aft, very aft part, you, you had a small table with bench seats either side where they could do, the conductor could do his paperwork and so forth. Also, a dining car. We had the famous old caboose stove, which uh, we can show you later up front. The uh, caboose stove served the purpose of heating, also for cooking. And uh, when they were out, they were out for extended period of time. They had uh, coffee, food, or anything. It was they, they had the ability to cook on the uh, on the caboose itself. 
And of course, that would be feeding the entire uh, the crew, also the head end crew, also if they had to. The caboose, we have the what we call the cupola, and that's one of the mainly. It's an observation point, and it is the when the train's moving. That's some, that's the main focus of the conductor and the brakeman in order to observe the moving train. And it's one, one, of, the, one of the more important uh, uh, positions within the, within the job. Also on the caboose, 1926, we also had uh, storage areas where the crew coming aboard, they had a briefcase that they carried with them, so for the brief and also, uh, uh, you know, general storage at this, uh, that's what these were available, had one on either side of, of the caboose. Two-man crew each, each had its own storage unit. But clothing, just about anything could be stored in here. And now we're in uh, the last part, last part, last area of the caboose that, uh, that we want to talk about. This portion, which is the rear of the caboose, also served as a kitchen, also served as an office for the crew. And if uh, some of what we were dealing with here, the stove that you're looking at here is uh, a small version, really, that was in Mom's kitchen back in the day, really. But the stove itself was, uh, was made in Hamilton, Ohio, and the, the patent date on it, it made very early 1900s. The patent date on this is uh, 1905, so that gives you a sense of when uh, when this was uh, was built, manufactured. And each uh, caboose uh, was equipped with uh, a, a stove for um, meals and also for heat. Uh, during the very late years, the ending years of, of using the caboose in the operation, a lot of these stoves were converted over to kerosene, and which was a little bit more convenient for the crew, but still it, it served the same function. When this, we're using coal fire stoves behind me, is uh, this was used for cold storage, and uh, that, that would be filled up when it comes back from each trip, this, these, these cabooses would be serviced. And we would have, the coal box would be filled with coal, you'd have water would be replenished for, uh, for drinking and so forth, and also uh, such uh, paper towels and the such would be uh, put on board and and made sure the supply was up. The uh, stove, of course, there's your firebox, and of course the bottom, just like the old type stoves, we got the draft for on, on the base and everything, and also to clean out the ashes towards the end of the trip. And of course these plates moved, come off, the smokestack was directly up and out the roof. This one has not been, we haven't hooked it up. Uh, but it is fully functional if we get this done. Also, in, in this on this side of, um, of the aft portion of the caboose, we had our water storage, which was in a tank, which now we have to get this fixed and placed. The tank itself would have been positioned up on the wall. It's been gravity fed into a small stainless steel sink, which we have to come up with one to plate, put in place here. Um, uh, and we hope to do that real soon. The, the other side of the caboose was, that was our office area. We had a small table with a small bench seat on either side for the conductor and also for the brakeman. Conductor had a lot of paperwork to do en route and he carried, uh, he carried a bill of lading for each car that they were pulling, which included, again, once again, as I said, it included the shipper's name, the content of the car, the box car, the, the hopper car, whichever it was, the weight of that content, which was very important to the crew, reference being able to pull it, reference the uh, horsepower for the, for the engines and so forth, and the number of engines, and also the um, uh, contained the, uh, the the shipper's uh, the, the shipper's name itself and information. So all of that was was with, with the conductor, and he managed that that whole thing. Uh, and made sure that the paperwork got to the destination. Also, in the rear corner on the floor, again, similar to the box in back of me, was another one. And towards later years, that particular box would have been lined with sheet metal, and that was an ice box, served in a big old, as a your caboose was ready for the next trip, simply go to the old ice car, which was uh, parked down under the cold temple here in the shop area. Ice hooks, ice tongs, 
big old block of ice, set it in that box, and give him some cooling for, uh, for, for the lunch and so forth. Uh, James Castle here at the Brunswick Heritage Museum. I am up in the uh, Coppola of Caboose number 1926 located in uh, Railroad Square. I'm having a conversation here with Norman Cornelius. So Norman, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit more about the Coppola and what would have happened up here? Okay, okay James. Uh, the, of course, Every railroad, every railroad, uh, uh, you know, uh, employee. Uh, uh, one of the largest things, or most important things, is railway safety. And uh, the cupola is designed was designed to give um, uh, uh, give the crew on on the caboose a a. It's not really an unrestricted look, but but I mean it's it's a it's a look as the train is moving. You're going to have the conductor is going to be on one side. You've got the brakeman sitting on the other side of the cupola. They're looking down line of sight, straight line of sight down the train, and observing for anything abnormal. And that could be, you know, I mean, if it's you know, slow moving, they don't want somebody trying to climb on the train. But mainly, it's safety stuff. They want to prevent a derailment. So, for the best part. And I, I'll be able to show you once we step out of the caboose. I can show you, uh, give you a pretty good idea of of what problems they were looking for, and it, and it had mainly to do with smoke. And if they they would happen to observe smoke coming from out from uh, from any one of the cars around the axle or anything, they're they're going to have to stop the train. If they don't stop the train, it's most certainly going to lead to to a serious derailment. Mm -hmm. It also looked for excessive sparking. Sparking, yes. And the other thing, if you guys will notice, uh, if you folks notice, but can see the windows behind us, you could also peek and see if there wasn't a train creeping up on you from behind, from a Very distance. Much so. Very much so. The um, the other things that they look for on a moving train, and this this would really be, uh, of course, as a railroad employee, you wouldn't take your attention away from your main job, okay? But one thing that you're, when a train is pulling, when the head end starts pulling to uh, pick up the rear end crew, and uh, doing that, he's pulling up slowly. Anyone who's working is, is, if not, you know, out of the corner of their eye, they're noticing the train itself, and they're looking, looking, uh, looking for anything abnormal, and and also looking for anything that might be dragging or or so forth, or got their ears peeled possibly for a break that's locked up. And if, the, if there is one unlocked up, they can release some of the air pressure that, that's on. They can do that from the side of the car. They used to be able to do that from the side of the car. It's, the technologies and a lot of that stuff has all changed. Much improved uh, uh, braking systems and, and, and the whole works with the uh, modern equipment that they have these days. But the um, most serious thing would be an axle, uh, a journal box, and, and that bearing free, freezing up and seizing, and, and it would certainly, it would lead to a derailment. And Norman, these windows uh, open, and uh, there is also a possibility that the brakeman could give a, a lantern signal from this back window as well, correct? That's correct. You could be signaling, like you say, the windows are sliders, so uh, yeah, you could be, and it would become necessary. Whether you were in the cupola, or if you were out on the platform on the front or, or the rear of the caboose, in order to signal the head end, you know, keep in mind there's no voice communications, no verbal communications between the two. Okay, so you've got to signal either with a flag, with a, a lighted fusee, which is very bright, or a lantern, or something of this nature to, to you know, get the attention of the crew up front. And the last thing that I wanted to point out about uh, the Coppola is, you know, having a regular crew riding on this every day or every other day, there tends to be a bond that gets created with railroad workers because while you're setting up here for hours, you're talking. Yes. You're talking about family, you're talking about fishing, you're talking about hunting, you're talking about railroad stuff. So there, you know, uh, railroad workers tend to have a bond that is formed by just spending hours and hours together. Yeah, yeah, that, that crew would, uh, that, that, that crew, both the uh, rear end uh, or the caboose crew, the brakeman conductor, yes, they're, they're going to take many, many trips together. 
and anything out of Brunswick uh, back in the day, whether they were westbound to Cumberland, you're, you're, you're spending a, a couple of, anywhere from a couple of hours, three hours, or uh, if, if you're on a work train, uh, if you're busy, you're together all day. But, uh, but yeah, you're going to form some kind of a bond and you depend on each other, not only, you know, you know uh, for, you know, for company and stuff and for, for the knowledge of the other employee also, but safety. Uh, they, they, watch, they watch very closely to make sure everybody stays safe. Yes, and, uh, as we were talking inside of, uh, inside of the caboose earlier, as uh, James and I set up in the cupola, uh, at, at, which is the observation point when the train's moving you're going to have if you remember what I was talking about you're going to have the conductor setting on one side and you're, you'll have the brakeman setting on the other side of the, of the cupola they're, they're eyeballing looking down the line of sight of the train down on the side looking for any problem areas or anything at all that might be abnormal that might uh, cause them to want to stop the train for some reason and I had indicated that I could show you on the outside one of the main things and, and a, a really a safety issue that they would be looking for. These are the journal boxes and um, this is your axle and everything is, is in. Highly, uh, it's, a, it's a high maintenance piece of equipment and each rail car was equipped with this type of uh, setup for the axles and so forth. Bearings in here, these journals are normally closed and they would be oiled on, on, uh, on occasions kept oil in here to lube for lubricant. Down inside it's uh, similar to uh, your, your mom's old rag mop and so forth for the kitchen floor. You've got your you've got it's like a rag mop in there that soaks that oil up. Well that's kept kept the axle and everything the bearings lubricated. If this dries out you're going to have excessive heat very very uh, 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 an awful lot of heat which can get to the point where it's going to turn red and eventually it would seize up and the, uh, the wheel and axle everything would seize. If that happens the next thing you're, you're going to have is a derailment and that could happen on any car and uh, within the uh, on the train and that's what they're that's one of the main things that they're looking for. What they would be looking at would be smoke because you've got oil in here and you've got that mop like affair down in there that keeps everything lubricated naturally that oil would uh, it, it eventually catch on fire but you're going to have an awful lot of smoke coming out of these and that's what the crew is looking for if that happens they're going to have to stop the train and um, like I say very uh, um, work intensive to keep this going as we discussed earlier we're probably about 80% uh, complete with the with the rehab on the caboose Still some more lettering to be done, which, uh, which we do hope to get done uh, before cold weather sets in. But as you look, um, for one thing, we work our way up the caboose, because we've got the caboose 1926. These numbers have traveled with this caboose since, uh, since it was built. Also, in the middle, which is going to go right centered in between the windows just above me, we'll have the Capitol Dome. Now the Capitol Dome has been with the with the B and O railroad system, uh, I think, since the beginning. Towards the mid 1940s, they added a slogan in there that, uh, which was very good because it explains exactly what the B and O railroad system did. That slogan reads, "Linking 13 great states to the nation," and really, uh, for freight delivery and passenger service, that's exactly what the B and O system did. So it's really neat, and that will be placed and, and painted uh, just between the windows above my head. Also on the ex extreme top of the caboose, uh, from, the, from the rear to the front, we'll have spelled out the letters Baltimore and Ohio will, will be placed there. And that will also be done in white. All of this will be done in white.